back to another class of principles of organismal biology. Last lecture, you learned about natural selection. You learned that that was proposed by Russell Wallace in conjunction with Darwin, Charles Darwin, these two amazing naturalists. Today, we're gonna learn all the evolutionary forces that are very important. In other words, natural selection is one evolutionary force but there are many others. So today we're gonna learn a, a little bit more about them. Today's lecture is evolution of populations. And we're gonna describe the five evolutionary forces or the five forces driving evolution of populations. And you are also going to understand the mechanisms of each of these evolutionary forces. Before we do that, let's do a quick recap of the things that you have learned over the past lectures. And I want to warn you, this is half real and half fiction. So let's look at this um, very romantic couple, Aragon and Arwen. Humans have 46 chromosomes in diploid condition, we have said that. And when the cells undergo meiosis, they form gametes that have 23 chromosomes. So this is what they have. And well, Arwen is not a human, she's an elf. So look at the ears, she has elf ears. But elves also have 43, 46 chromosomes and 23 chromosomes in their haploid gametes. So product of this very passionate and romantic relationship is this baby, half human and half elf. If we look at the chromosomes, the 46 chromosomes, we will see them like here. This is a karyotype. And the numbers of chromosomes have been given randomly, right? So now we have this chromosome 11 here. Look at this baby elf with the, or half human, half elf, but with some features of elves, right? Um, okay, so if we look at this chromosome 11, we are gonna see these two copies, one that is coming from Arwen, and another one that is coming from Aragorn. In here, we have different genes, different loci that are going to be responsible of producing different proteins. So if we look at this, in each of these lines, you'll have, in this case, FF, you have a homozygous for the, this insulin gene. So that means that this baby only has one allele of this gene, of this locus. Now, the same letter, and if it's lowercase or, or, or uppercase, means that they are homozygous. If you have lowercase and, and capital case or, or big, like this one, little b and big b, that means a heterozygous. So you have, in this case, we have two alleles in this gene, in this, in this locus. Now, let's take a look to this, the EE. So this is a heterozygous. And this is a gene that is actually responsible. If you have this little E, in this case, in this example, it will be responsible of sickle cell anemia. We cover, we say, we have said that there are different types of mutations and there are some that when they mutate, they cause a change in the amino acid. This is a single mutation that has a tremendous effect on the phenotype. So in the wild type, the, the codon is GAA, and that's gonna form a glutamine, the amino acid. In the, the, this wild type form, this phenotype of the red blood cells are circular. But when we have this mutation, this is gonna be resulting in GUA instead of a GAA, and that codes for a valine instead of glutamine. That simple mutation, it's gonna cause these red blood cells to be sickle, the sickle shape or banana shape that I told you before. So this is the heterozygous condition of sickle cell anemia, and that causes um, some very negative effects in some people carrying this um, recessive gene. 
what other thing can we can we see can we read from these two chromosomes right here so let's look at the hair color this baby has the same color as the parents because both of them have this dominant allele the a which let's just assume it's this half section is the hazel knot color and what about the shape of the ears so what can we learn from this this is saying that we should expect that if the baby is um, from this dad, as this is capital, this is a big, big B, the baby should be, should have human ears, but it, it doesn't, it doesn't. So I suspect there was a cheating going on. Sorry guys. I hope that you enjoyed this half section as light. Now let's jump into what we are gonna go into today. I just wanted to review and recap a lot of concepts in, in the former slide. What is evolution of populations? In the sense of Darwin, we have defined that it is descendant with modification. Darwin actually didn't use the word evolution in the, the book that he wrote, but he used descendant with modification and it's the sense of that you descend from your parents, but you are not identical. So there is a change so they are, the things or species are not fixed. That, that's the concept that you have to remember there. Nowadays, we define evolution as change in allele frequencies. You guys know what allele is now, a variant of a gene. And back then, we, when Darwin um, wrote his book, he didn't know about alleles. There wasn't such a thing. There weren't genes. You know, there was not much um, knowledge, but still he got it right. So nowadays, as I was saying, evolution is changes in allele frequency. And this is at the population level. This is important because some people get confused. Let's say this way. Individuals mutate. So you could have a mutation in your, in your cells, and some of them can be in your germline. So that means that it can, it can be in the gametes, and those are going to be passed to the next generation, right? The ones that are in your somatic cells, in your ears, in your eyes, and other parts of your body are not going to be passed to the next generation. So those are the, the ones that are going to have a longer effect. The ones that go, that, that pass to the next generation, in the gametes. So individuals can mutate, but populations evolve. Evolution happens at the population level. Now, look at these populations of Picatrius. I hope that you enjoy this. And if not, just think about a flower or whatever else. What is the allele frequency of big A, the, the allele in this population? So count all of the big A's in, in each of these. So how many big A's do we have? And what's the, the allele frequency of big A? Well, if you count it, we have 10 individuals and each of them have two alleles, one from their mom, one from their dad. And this means that we have one allele only in the population. So there is no genetic variation. That means that all of the individuals, 100%, have this allele, and we represent that the frequency as one. One. We, the frequencies we we use zero to one to represent them. Now, imagine there is a mutation, and then we have uh, an allele, allele lower A or or little A, which is responsible for black wings. So what is the allele frequency of A in this population? Now you have to, to make the same. So I'll give you a, a minute to, to think about it. So count the big A's and the little A's and estimate how, what's the frequency of the big A and the little A. Okay, so you have again 10 individuals and if you count all of the uh, big A's, you have 10, and all of the little A's, you also have 10. So that's 50% that's will be big A and 50% will be little A. 
I'm putting these two op these two sequences. Just these are imaginary sequences for you to understand that the alleles. If we sequence the alleles, they're going to have these mutations. So they are variants of this gene, right? So we have two alleles in this case, and this is the frequency for each of these alleles. Now we have covered in the past mutation and how mutations arise and and that happens during replication, right? The DNA polymerase commits a mistake, makes a mutation, some of them get corrected, but some others don't get corrected. And those are the ones that pass to the next generation or could have passed to the next generation. So we have covered that, but okay, let's think about this in this context. So we have this um, population of Pikachus with only big A's, so frequency of one, and all of them are going to produce ovules and, and gametes because, yes, these are male and female. Just let's pretend. And, but there, there is going to be one ovule in this case that gets a mutation, right? And this mutation gets passed from a couple of generations. Let's, let's just pretend that maybe three generations after we have these frequencies, right? So now the frequency of the the leaf frequencies in the population has changed due through mutations. Sometimes in your book, actually, it's not listed as one of the evolutionary forces because actually mutation is the source of all genetic variation. But it does change the frequencies, right? If you have one frequency in one, in one generation and you have now one individual that has this mutation, the, the frequency is going to change. So after a few generations, you could see this, um, this mutation getting fixed. And it could be associated to other processes as well. But mutation, it is, it's a force, an evolutionary force. So in the next ones are natural selection, genetic drift, gene flow, and non-random mating. So let's watch a video that actually covers natural selection, genetic drift, and gene flow. It's a very informative video, so pay attention. Variation is found in human populations and in other populations, such as this population of island beetles. Color in these beetles is determined by different versions of a gene, different alleles. Green is the dominant trait, so green beetles have two green alleles, or a green allele and a brown allele. Brown beetles have two brown alleles. By counting the brown alleles and green alleles, we can calculate that this population has 30% brown alleles and 70% green alleles. The frequency of brown alleles is greater than the frequency of brown beetles because some green beetles have a brown allele. Allele frequencies change as populations evolve. The island is suffering from a drought, and in this dry environment, brown beetles are better camouflaged than green beetles. Birds are more likely to see and eat green beetles. Over time, brown beetles survive and reproduce more than green beetles. This is an example of natural selection. Individuals with inherited traits better suited to their environment survive and produce more offspring than other individuals. Here, natural selection causes the frequency of the brown allele to increase. Through natural selection, the population has become better adapted to its new environment. Genetic drift occurs when populations evolve due to chance events. Let's see how genetic drift affects this small population of beetles. Chance constantly affects which beetles actually reproduce and which of their alleles they pass on. In a small population, chance events produce large fluctuations in allele frequencies from one generation to the next. Here, the frequency of the brown allele has decreased to zero, and the population is left with only green beetles. Genetic drift also occurs in large populations. But in a large population, 
genetic drift has less effect because it causes much smaller fluctuations in allele frequencies. Other random events can also lead to genetic drift. By chance, this volcano kills more brown beetles than green beetles, causing the frequency of the green allele to increase. Gene flow describes evolution due to individuals moving into or out of a population. When green and brown beetles migrate into the all-green population, the frequency of the brown allele increases. Natural selection, genetic drift, and gene flow are the major mechanisms responsible for the evolution of all populations. Together, they shape populations of beetles as well as humans. Okay, so natural selection was postulated, as I mentioned, by Charles Darwin and Russell Wallace. What did they do? They provided and reviewed evidence for evolution, and they also provide a mechanism for evolution. And the mechanism is through natural selection. Remember, natural selection is the differential survival and reproduction of individuals due to difference in the phenotype. And those are observable features, the traits that we have. Sometimes it's um, important to notice that the phenotype can, can be more hidden, like some smells, some, arom some volatile com compounds, right? In the chemistry, just think about molecules floating around. But those are, those are part of the phenotype, just that we cannot see them um, in, with, our, with our eyes, but they are the result of the expression of the genes. So they are, they are compound, components that we need to pay attention as well. Now, evolution is a process, and natural selection is one tool, one of several, as I mentioned, by which it works. In this case, in this case, we have these two different traits, and the environment was selecting for one trait. In this case, the environment is this large, scary bird that was able to detect more um, readily the brown beetles. And what is very important is that these traits, these, these colors, need to be in the DNA. They need to be um, determined in the DNA. In other words, these traits need to be heritable. It needs to be heritable variation. And this variation can be either um, confer more uh, success in survivability or in reproduction. In this case, this is one example that this color, the brown color, enhanced the, the survivability in, the, in these beetles, but not in the green beetles. And it is important to notice that it will only happen if the background is brown. If now we have another condition, let's, let's think about it. Um, uh, a big rain comes and there's a lot of grass. Now maybe the brown beetles will be more evident. So this is important for you to realize that the environment is always changing and the traits that are adaptive in some conditions might not be adaptive in other conditions. But if we think about an example of greater reproduction, that would be a trait that instead of producing two beetles every time, you might be producing five beetles. And therefore, that gene is going to be passed more often. And then you might be having this more, um, more offspring. So these, these, will be, these are the two um, scenarios in which a heritable trait needs to be passed and then fixed by natural selection. So to recap, in order for natural selection to occur, three conditions, three conditions must be met. And the first one is that it needs to be variation. In this example, we have a brown beetle and a green beetle. In the Pikachu example, we have a Pikachu a wingless and one that was winged. So those are, those are traits. Now, the variation must be heritable. 
that means that it needs to pass from the, the parents to the offspring. And that means that it needs to be in the DNA. And, and if you know about epigenetics, you know that it, you could also, we can have methylations in the DNA, then can have a result or, or modify the expression of a particular gene without changing the nucleotide, and that's epigenetics. So, but then regardless, that, that variation needs to be heritable for natural selection to occur. So all of these, we assume, or, or in these examples, we have genes that codify for being green or being brown. Now think about this. I say, what if we consider the trait of your hair, long hair versus short hair? Is that a feature that is gonna to pass to the next generation? No, right, because your kids might be having long hair if you let them grow. Um, and you could have other traits that are not actually uh, heritable. Now, the third condition is that, again, the offspring it's gonna have, or this trait is associated to having more offspring due to higher survival or to reproduction, higher reproduction. In this example, let's go back to Pikachu. We have some Pikachus that can walk and others then can walk and can fly. Now imagine if we have a frequency of a big A of 0.5 and little a of 0.5 as well. So it's the same example as earlier. Now let's imagine that there is a flooding or there are some rat traps that all of the walking Pikachus tend to fall in. So that, that's kind of the, the idea that I want you to think about natural selection. So it's, it's something more natural, not the, the artificial traps, but the result is gonna be the same. So if you think about a flooding that is killing all of the walking Pikachus, then in the next generation or after natural selection, you are going to have an increase in this allele that has that is responsible of flying. So you might have still some survivals or survivors that have that don't have wings just because they were lucky. But you see, after natural selection, now we have more um, more of the little a. So now we have 0.8. Of frequency. So you just have to count these again, and you have five individuals and 10 and eight little A's in here, and only two big A's. So that's the frequency that you have now after natural selection. And if this keeps going, if there are recurrent floodings, maybe after several or, or after a few more generations all of these uh, Pikachus with wings will survive and none of the other ones. So you will erase the big A allele or the allele that carries this, um, this mutation. This is, this is where, where some students get confused. So I want to emphasize the following. Natural selection doesn't create new traits, right? Mutation does create new traits, but natural selection doesn't. Natural selection is actually editing or selecting for these traits. I want you to think about natural selection as a filter. So you go through a filter and you just let pass some, some genes with certain features. So that's what natural selection is doing. The local environment is gonna be determining what traits are gonna be selected. Just remember at this gay bird selecting on this, um, brown beetles because it was preferentially eating the green beetles. And these scenarios can be very different. It could be a, a predator or it could be the preference for mating. It could be water, other conditions, temperature, right? Um, plants that get adapted to higher temperatures. So if they have a gene that confers um, adaptation to higher temperatures, they are going to survive more and they're going to reproduce more and pass those genes to the next generation. So individuals that are not able to tolerate higher temperatures might die and, and disappear from, from the population over time. So then we, we have covered um, mutation, natural selection. Let's go over genetic drift. So genetic drift, can, it's something that happens by chance. 
So we are not invoking natural selection to explain it, but it's more about something random. In this figure, by chance, this volcano that is erupting right now has killed more brown beetles just because the, the brown beetles that they were wandering in higher numbers in this area where the lava passed. There is, there is nothing related to a trait that um, conferred them, an adaptive trait that conferred them more reproduction or survival. It's about just being lucky, being at the, at the right time in the, in the right place. Okay, so this is the idea of genetic drift. In this case, after this event, we also have a change in the allele frequencies. So in this figure, I want you to think about what's the allele frequency of the green allele. And what's the allele frequency for the brown allele? So it's probably more like 80% of green. So that means 0.58 of green and 0.42 or 42% of the brown allele based on this, right? And after, after the brown allele gets um, wiped out, you might increase this number by chance, the 50, 58, just by chance. Another thing that I, I want you to, to consider is that the genetic drift is happening all the time without major um, catastrophic events. And it's happening a lot in meiosis. In meiosis, by chance, we have sorting of our, our chromosomes. They get sorted randomly to the different gametes, right? So we don't know if chromosome number two from our mom is gonna come into this or into this gamete and chromosome number four from our mom is gonna be in this or in this gamete. So we have a lot of combinations possibilities and how these are segregating. Remember the law of segregation of Mendel. This is um, kind of the same, the same idea. Now, we also have an event that is called recombination that only happens in prophase one of meiosis. And this event of recombination, it's going to um, tell us that in, during recombination, the chromosomes, the homolog chromosomes, that means the chromosome from our mom and our dad, they're gonna be pairing and they're gonna exchange material and then retrieve with new material. So we're shuffling genes around. That's another way to have genetic drift. Um, and lastly, we have gametes. We produce tons of gametes all the time and, and men, in our species, men produce a lot more, or, mainly in any species, males always produce a lot more of the cheaper gametes. But then, just another random event happens when your parents created you, right? Because of all of these millions of gametes and combinations possible, they made you, and that is random. So if they could have waited a little bit longer and have a, a, a child the next day, the combinations could have been different. Okay, maybe not the next day, but the next month, or, or at least the next day because of that has different sperm production, whatever. We are lucky guys to be here. Let's recap. So random select, um, random sampling of alleles happen in meiosis because independent orientation of chromosomes in meiosis, crossing over of chromosomes in meiosis, and random fertilization. Now, we have covered genetic drift. What is the fourth evolutionary force? Gene flow. In the example of beetles, um, now we have different islands and just the movement of one individual from one island to another one is gonna change the allele frequencies because now, let's imagine, let's see, in this log, we have more brown beetles and only one, um, one green beetle here, right? So we have three brown beetles that are arriving in a population that has only 
green beetles. So now we have gene flow. So movement from individuals that have different genetic makeup to this other island. That is the, the flow of genes from one island to another one. So the frequencies are changing. Another way, very easy to understand of gene flow. And, and in this case, we are having gene flow of the whole individual. The whole individual is arriving there. But there are ways in which gametes can arrive to this new population and, and we can have gene flow. That happens fairly common with plants. Um, think about pollen and how pollen gets dispersed. Some plants can disperse their pollen with wind and it can travel long distances and it can arrive to this new island and pollinate plants that have a different genetic component. So yes, gene flow can um, move whole individuals or it can move gametes. Okay, check. Now, the last one, non-random mating. So non-random mating occurs when the probability that two individuals in a population will mate is not the same. It's not the same. And that is opposed to a panmictic population where we expect in, in a panmictic population that all of the individuals are potential partners and they will have equal probability of mating, right? So there is no bias in, the, in this uh, random mating. Whereas in the non-random mating, they will be biased towards a mating with um, some individuals over others. So to make this example, I, I'm gonna ask you this very silly question. Who will you invite to go out and reproduce with? I usually ask this question in my face-to-face -face lectures and, and you probably imagine um, you will have the opportunity to pick any of, of these and I don't care about your sexual preference, you can pick whatever. I even have this option of all of them, maybe you really want to date all of them and reproduce with all of them. But at the end of this, um, I'm gonna share what I have usually found in my lectures that the, the frequencies are not the same, so we tend to pick um, some features. And obviously our population, our um, species is very, very diverse and we actually have a very chance of reproduce regardless of your phenotype. But um, this gets more evident in other systems. So non-random mating. Um, we, we have some biases to, to some phenotypes and that could also change the allele frequency. So we have covered this class and, and we have learned that there are five evolutionary forces that can change the allele frequencies. And that's what nowadays we call evolution, evolution of populations. I hope that you have enjoyed this class. See you next time.